guys, welcome back to Coach Hall Writes. So today we're gonna to be talking about a webinar that the College Board had for AP Lang teachers. And I wanted to give you guys some insight into the things that I found interesting and things that I think students need to know as they're preparing for their exam. And I'm also gonna go over a few frequently asked questions because I know you guys are working hard to prepare for this exam and I wanna make sure that you guys have the most accurate information possible. So while there are still some unknowns, we do have a little bit more clarity. First of all, they did say that you guys can actually print the exam passage. So this is interesting because initially we thought that you wouldn't be able to because of testing security. But if you have a printer and you choose to print, you can actually print the exam passage on exam day. So if you choose to do this, there's a couple things you need to know. First of all, it will happen during the testing window. You don't get to access it early or anything like that. The exam window is 50 minutes. So you have 45 minutes to read, Annotate if you choose to, which you absolutely should in my opinion, and write your essay, and you have an additional five minutes to upload and submit. There's going to be a timer. From the sounds of it, it's basically gonna be a 50 minute timer that counts down, and it's going to turn red when it gets to five minutes. And so you wanna make sure that if you're not using the timer, because you can actually like basically cancel it if you don't wanna see it on your screen, or if you're handwriting the essay and therefore not looking at a screen, you wanna make sure that you're keeping track of your time because you must submit in that testing window. But anyway, the point is, is that if you print, it has to be part of that 50 minutes. So keep that in mind as you are factoring in how you're gonna take your exam and where you're gonna take your exam and things like that. So if you don't have access to a printer, there are still ways that you can annotate. So please don't think that you're gonna be hindered because you can still do annotations on a separate piece of paper. You can also also just simply type annotations on a doc because they said that you can actually have Microsoft Word and Google Docs. I still have so many questions about that that I'm hoping they're gonna answer. And as far as when we'll get those answers, it sounds like we're gonna get those tutorials and simulations that they've been talking about the week of April 27th. So definitely the end of April. And so that's when we should start to see exactly what the platform looks like and how this is all gonna happen. And if you're a very visual person like I am, that's what I would be waiting for as well. So we are gonna get that information, but I do think it's gonna be helpful for some students to be able to print. And if that is something that you're interested in, now you have a few weeks to figure out how you might do that if you don't currently have that option. Okay, so the next thing that was brought up was actually a question in response to the fact that they brought up you know, Word and Docs and the fact that there's gonna be online testing and that was if students are going to be able to use like essentially spell check, Grammarly, things like that, and would that present an unfair advantage? And this wasn't a college board question, this was more of an opinion question presented to a group of AP Lang teachers. And so I wanna just kind of clarify because it does reference grammar a little bit in the rubric, but I wanna basically let you guys know my two cents on this, and this is not necessarily the official college board stance, but just my perspective as a teacher. Basically, if your spelling and grammar is legible, readable, if I can understand what you're saying, even if you're spelling things phonetically, then I don't have an issue with it because I'm looking at the content. I'm looking at your analysis. I'm looking at how well you are analyzing the choices and the rhetorical situation for this, like the Q2, that's what I'm looking for. But keep in mind, like you're not gonna be compared to other people. You are graded or scored is probably a better term based on your individual performance. I know there's a lot of questions about cheating, especially with like the recent college admission scandal. My advice would be stay in your own lane and just you do what you need to do to have academic integrity, but don't worry about things like spelling. Like it's not something to worry about that other people might be using spell check in your handwriting your essay. Like that's not gonna be something that prevents you from getting a certain score in my opinion. And anecdotally, I can tell you that I had a student a couple years ago who spelled phonetically, but had brilliant ideas and still got a very high composite score because the ideas were there. So I would say spelling's not something we really need to worry about. So one of the frequently asked questions is, what score do you need in order to get a certain type of composite? And guys, we don't know this information, but that's actually not a bad thing because we never really know this information for sure. You need to remember a few things. Number one, this is unprecedented because we've never had at-home testing. We've never had 45 minute exams. This is also the first year with a six point rubric. So there's a lot of unknowns for AP Lang. So we do know that it's a six point rubric. We do know that you get a composite score of up to a five. And so presumably it would make sense, I guess, if you know you got a six on your essay, you got a five composite. 
I'm not a math person, but that makes sense to me. However, they have made a few statements that have suggested that students' essays will be read twice. I'm not really sure how that would be factored in. They also said that depending on like the level of the passage itself, that could take certain things into consideration. And this is normal, guys. Like they don't release any kind of information. Like they don't say, oh, you must earn this score and you'll get this composite. And so if you stay in your own lane, and you show academic integrity. And right now you are writing at a very consistent four out of six essay level. Look at that rubric and figure out what you need to do to try to earn a five. You know, like figure out where you are and where you want to be by May. And I would say that the rubric is gonna be your guide. I would look at those College Board tutorials and resources, but I wouldn't worry about which essay score do I need for a certain composite because in some sense, you don't know that. So just know that the better you do, presumably the better composite you would have, but there's certain things that we won't know they're outside of your control. So focus on preparing for the exam, but don't get bogged down with the numbers right now. It's just not something that you can really control. And while it took me a long time to learn this, and I wish I knew it as a high school student, you need to worry about the things that you can control. And you can control your preparedness and that kind of thing, but you can't control the numerical breakdown of things. So don't worry about that kind of thing, but don't be upset that they're not giving you a concrete number because we wouldn't have known this anyway. If the exam was a normal full exam like it was initially thought to be we still wouldn't know the exact breakdown we could guess we could guess now but we still wouldn't know so we won't know until they start to release the score distributions and things like that but that doesn't come out until the summer and to be honest I usually find that stuff out via Twitter so if you want to know as soon as I know then follow the college board and Trevor Packer on Twitter because that's usually where I find stuff out first so just FYI <laughs> Okay, so the next question is a really important one and that is what do you do if you have technology problems the day of the test? So let's say you're taking the test and your device fails or the internet cuts out. I actually had that happen to me today. I was doing a Google Hangout with my students and all of a sudden the internet stopped. And I had to go from my laptop to my phone and I was able to finally jump back in on the call. But if that was the AP test, you can't switch from device to device. So what do you do in those instances? We have a little bit of clarity on this, but we're gonna get more clarity as time elapses. So what we know now is that you will be able to essentially submit a ticket and so then they will let you know by a certain date I believe May 26 if you are able to do the makeup testing so what I would recommend and this is kind of pending what more info they give but if you have problems on test day document those problems and so certain problems are gonna be considered obviously serious whereas others are not so for instance if you're taking the test and your baby brother's crying in the background that's not something that the College Board is going to let you do a makeup test about but if you have have a power outage in your town that's probably something that is going to be able to be documented and addressed so I would document something if there's a time like if your device powers down at a certain time and it's down for 10 minutes I would document the exact times that it's down if you're able to record that things are down and they say that's okay to do I would do so I've had students do that for me personally for classroom purposes when they've tried to submit something electronically and they wanted to prove to me that they literally could not submit it by the deadline, they would like show me their screen and they would show me it spiraling and they would pan down and they would show me the date and the time so I knew exactly what was happening. And so they had evidence. Now, will the college board accept that? I don't know, but I do know that if I was a student who was in that situation, I would do everything I could and I would report it as soon as possible. So keep that in mind that there is a system in place. They are gonna give you guys some more information about that. My best advice is, as I said in some previous videos, number one, check your devices and stuff ahead of time. Have a backup plan in case there's an issue with your internet or whatever it is the day of, and you know this before you start taking the test. And also I would actually start practicing during your testing window. So I've encouraged my students to actually do some essays every Wednesday at 1 p.m. because for us, for our time zone, that's when they're taking the AP Lang exam. So if they're gonna be doing it on their computer, I've told them Wednesdays at 1 p.m. you should be on your computer writing just to kind of see how things go. And so if you can practice under those simulated circumstances, then it might help you as well. So my sincerest hope is that you don't have those problems on testing day, but just know that there is going to be some protocol in place. And my best advice is to make sure you're informed of that protocol in advance and just hope that you don't have to 
actually use it. The next question is, are we getting our scores during the usual window or is that also pushed back because the exam window is pushed back? And that's a really good question. They basically said that they're gonna try to do everything on the typical timeline and get the scores out during that usual window. However, it could take up to an additional two weeks, which is actually pretty understandable given everything that has happened. So I think we'll know more as they actually get through the reading process, but it's looking like it'll still be really close to the usual time, but it might be a slight delay. Next question has to do with the College Board statement that the exams are open note. So the question is, how does this pertain to AP Lang and what would you recommend go on a note sheet? So what I would recommend is that students actually make their own note sheet if possible. I do think teachers should hopefully provide a little bit of info if they think it's appropriate. But at the end of the day, I think that students are so different that you need to decide what is going to help you the most. So you can have teacher created resources, you can have your student notes or class notes, but my advice is less is more. So if it's information that you don't need, don't put it on your note sheet because for the usual exam, you don't get a note sheet anyway. But I do think that since you are allowed to have one, it would be beneficial to think about what would benefit you the most. So is it a particular graphic organizer that would help you? Is it a list of verbs that would help you? Are there certain sentence frames that you like? And honestly, thinking about my own students, each student has a different answer. Each student needs different things. Some students might not need one at all. Some students might want sentence frames and nothing else. Other students might want a list of verbs. Other students might want a graphic organizer. So it really depends. My recommendation is to actually try to make one either by hand or on Google Slides, or Google Docs, whatever it is that you wanna use and maybe make multiple renditions of it. So even in trying to make one for my own students that might hit a variety of needs, I have found that I've been rearranging things and playing around with different sizes and fonts and color coding and formats. And I think if students do that on their own, it helps them commit things to memory. And when I was a student myself, I found that when I was making a study sheet, I learned more because I had to make multiple renditions of it. And so if you are really truly trying to just remember things and get comfortable with things, then I would say customize it to your needs. But remember that the AP Lang exam is not a memory based test. It is an application of skills. So while there are certain things that I do believe would be useful to remember, at the end of the day, you are applying your skills to the passage given. It's not a recall test. So if you don't have a note sheet, then quite frankly, you're really not at a hindrance in my opinion because in August when you started this class, you weren't gonna have a note sheet anyway. So if you don't like a note sheet, if you don't want a note sheet, if your dog eats your note sheet the morning of the test, I really think you'll be okay. So can you have one? Yes, but just put whatever you need on there, make it neat and organized, don't make it cluttered, but really make wise decisions about what is going to help you the most. So the next question is, what does this confirm your exam email mean? Does this mean I'm re-registering? Okay, so no, it doesn't mean you're re-registering. So if you initially registered, they basically took that registration and they essentially moved everybody over to the new testing date. So you didn't have to do a thing for that. So you're fine in that regard. The confirmation is more of just making sure that a few things are happening. Number one, that they have you down for the correct exams. And also it's actually a really good way to make sure that you are receiving the emails from the college board. So look at what they've sent you and if it's correct, then presumably it would be fine to go ahead and confirm. If it's incorrect, talk to your teacher or your AP coordinator. Now, some of the inconsistencies might be because of which class it is, because some of the classes have a different type of exam now that things have changed. So um, just double check. If something looks wrong, then double check. But the idea here is to make sure that you're able to receive their emails and they're just asking you to confirm. So it's not a re-registration. And the other thing is, I don't know if this happened to other people in other states or other schools, but my own students had some weird delays with their emails and their text messages. So I had one student get a text that said, check your email, but then no email until the next day. But I had another student get an email and no text. I had one student get an email and text at the same time. And I had several students get neither until the next day anyway. So I'm not entirely sure what happened with all that, but at the end of the day, my biggest question to them was, did
did you ultimately get an email from the college board or at least recently have you gotten an email from the college board to the email address that you use to register because I want to make sure that they were getting communication and so if the answer is yes then for right now I'm satisfied because they're going to be communicating with you through that email address so if you're not getting those emails check your spam folder and also if not then check with your teacher, figure out if you have the right email, if there's any kind of glitch, things like that, because you want to be receiving those email communications. But like, do know, at least for my own personal students, like there was at least a 24 hour delay. It was very bizarre. Not totally sure what was happening, but we did ultimately get those emails. So if you are getting a confirm email, it's not a re-registration email. It's just simply trying to figure out if the exams that they have you listed for are in fact the correct exams. All right, guys, there you have it. That was the information that I felt was most useful to students as of the April 14th webinar and also some of the answers to questions that you guys have been asking in the comment section. So if you guys have additional questions, let me know. And also if you have video requests, let me know. And until next time, guys, happy writing.